Welcome back to Physical Chemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In some of the previous videos, we've talked about phase diagrams, and I think I mentioned in those videos that this part of physical chemistry was my least favorite. Um, it can be kind of confusing. Um, phase diagrams can be somewhat complicated in this course. Hopefully try to break this down and we're going to talk about the Clausius-Clapeyron equation in this video. I'm going to derive this equation. Um, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation is shown down here. Okay, But in order to get the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, we first have to get the Clapeyron equation. Okay, The Clapeyron equation um, is used for a slightly different purpose than the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, although they are very closely related. All right, so I've got a phase diagram shown down here. The phase diagram is given as a function of pressure on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. Okay, And I have in the lighter color up here, phase one. I don't care what phase it is, just any phase. And then down here in the darker color, we have phase two. Okay, Now, if we're on this red line right here, this is the boundary between these two phases. Anywhere on this line, Phase one and phase two are in equilibrium with each other. And really when we're at equilibrium, we mean that the pressure is not changing and the temperature is not changing. Both of these are at equilibrium along that red line. Okay, And remember that uh, when you're at equilibrium, we say the chemical potentials of phase one and of phase two are equal. Chemical potential, recall, is given by the Greek symbol mu. I've got a couple mu's up here in some equations, which we'll get to. Um, chemical potential, or mu, recall, is the free energy divided by the number of moles, so G divided by N. So in some ways, you could think of mu, or the chemical potential, as a molar free energy, kind of like we had molar volume, molar entropy, and so forth. Chemical potential is a molar free energy. It's G divided by N. Okay, but when two phases are in equilibrium with each other, we say that their chemical potentials are equal. In other words, we say that mu1, or the chemical potential of phase 1, is equal to the chemical potential of phase 2, or mu2. All right. Now, suppose we're at point A on this phase diagram. So that's on this red line at a point where phase 1 and phase 2 are in equilibrium. Let's suppose I wanted to move from point A to point B. Okay, so if I move from point A to point B, notice that both the pressure is going to increase and the temperature is going to increase. Okay, and I'm assuming for this purpose that this movement, it's actually blown up a lot here, but these two points are very, very, very close together. Okay, in fact, the distance you would travel vertically is dp, just a, an infinitesimally small change in pressure, and the amount that you would actually move along the horizontal axis is a very small temperature dt, an infinitesimally small temperature. Okay, so these two points are not very far from each other, but if I move from point A to point B, um, I want uh, the two phases to remain in equilibrium. So the way I would denote that is an infinitely, infinitesimally small change in mu1 would have to be equal to an infinitesimally small change in mu2. So d mu1 equals d mu2. Okay, so I put this in differential notation. All right. Now, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to expand out each differential. And you've probably done this in a chapter where you covered partial derivatives and thermodynamics. So recalling that each of these chemical potentials are functions of pressure and temperature here, I can expand mu1 as follows, or d mu1. So it's the partial of mu1 with respect to pressure at constant temperature times dp, plus the partial of mu1 with respect to temperature at constant pressure dt. Okay, so that's the left side of this equation for mu1. So now I'm essentially going to do the same thing on the right side, except it's going to be for d mu2. So I'm going to have the partial of mu2 with respect to p, or pressure, at constant temperature times dp, plus the partial derivative of mu2 with respect to t at constant p times dt. The only difference between the right side here and the left side should be the subscripts on the mu. So the right side should have 1, the right side should have two. These ones and twos correspond to these two phases down here in the diagram. Okay. Now, obviously we don't have a function for chemical potential, so we can't just differentiate this with respect to P. So we're going to use what are called Maxwell relations. And in a previous video very long ago, and probably in your course, you covered some of the derivation of these Maxwell relations. Now, we had a Maxwell relation that looked very similar to this first one. It was the partial of G, 
with respect to p at constant t is equal to v. Okay, without this line over it, just v. So that was one of our Maxwell relations. But recall, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, that chemical potential is simply g divided by n. It's the free energy divided by the number of moles. So if I took what was partial of g with respect to p at constant t and divide through by n, now I have the partial of mu with respect to p at constant t, and then I would have volume divided by n, and that's a molar volume. So whenever you see this line above a quantity like this, that implies we're dealing with a molar quantity. Okay, so this is molar volume. In the past, we used a previous nomenclature where we put the quantity V and then like a subscript M or N. Um, that would be a molar quantity. That's one way. This is a second way we can put a molar quantity. Okay? Now, we also had a second Maxwell relation. It was the partial of G with respect to T at constant P equals negative entropy or negative S. But in the same way, if we replace... Uh, mu, uh, the g with mu, which means dividing both sides by the number of moles, we get the partial of mu with respect to t at constant p is equal to negative molar s. Okay, again, the line over that means we have a molar quantity. And pretty much all I'm going to do is find these corresponding partial derivatives, okay, in this expansion right here that I just made, and I'm going to replace them with their molar quantity and with the appropriate subscript. And so ultimately what I get, for example, if I have the partial of mu1 with respect to p at constant t, I can replace all of this with molar volume, but it's going to be molar volume 1. And so if I do that with each one of these partial derivatives, there's four of them, I get the molar volume 1 times dp minus molar entropy 1 dt, equals molar volume 2 dp minus molar entropy 2 dt. All right, so that's where I get this. And from here, I can actually, uh, first of all, divide through both sides by dt. Okay, And I'm going to neglect the actual algebra of this. But it suffices to say if you divide both sides through by dt and then group the entropy terms and group the volume terms, you can actually rearrange it into this equation down here, which is now a differential equation. It's the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature, dp dt, is equal to the change in molar entropy divided by the change in molar volume. Okay, so this is almost at the Clapeyron equation. Now, the molar entropy or the change in it, I should say, is somewhat of a difficult quantity to measure. We would want to put this in terms of something else that's easier to measure. So recall that any entropy, let's say S, is just equal to the corresponding enthalpy H divided by T. Okay? So we can substitute out this change in molar entropy for the change in molar enthalpy, delta H molar, divided by T. And so by making that substitution, I can get this into what's called the Clapeyron equation, which is dp dt equals the change in molar enthalpy, delta H molar, divided by temperature, divided by the change in molar volume. And this right here is the Clapeyron equation. Okay, we're going to need this to ultimately get the clausius clapeyron equation, but we're going to spend a little bit of time here and talk about what the Clapeyron equation is used for. Generally speaking, the Clapeyron equation predicts the slope of the tangent line of the boundary between solid and liquid phases. Okay, so the key here is solid and liquid phases. So for example, again, this is probably not true in this phase diagram. I'm just making this up. But suppose that... Uh, this phase up here, phase one, let's say that was a solid, okay? And then let's say down here was a liquid. Okay, down here is the liquid, all right? So if I uh, knew what the enthalpy of fusion was, right, because the, the phase change between solid and liquid would be fusion or melting, if you wanted to look at it that way, if I knew what the enthalpy of that process was, and I knew what the change in molar volume was, because remember, whenever you actually melt a substance into its liquid form, the volume is going to change a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. It's going to be a very small change. But if I knew that enthalpy, that change in molar volume, and the temperature that I was operating at, 
um, I could figure out therefore what the slope of this boundary is. Okay, And actually the clapper on equation is actually how you predict what the slope of this line is. And one of the applications of the clapper on equation is you can use it to solve for one of these two variables if you don't know it. For example, you can use it to solve for the enthalpy of fusion or melting depending which direction you're going. Um, the molar enthalpy that is, or you could use it if you didn't know it to solve for the change in molar volume. But this dp dt, that's the slope of this boundary right here. And specifically the Clapeyron equation is going to be used for predicting that uh, slope um, for the boundary between solid and liquid phases. That's the Clapeyron equation. Okay. Um, we're now going to look at the derivation of the clausius clapeyron equation. That's over here. It's going to use what we just had for the Clapeyron equation. But here's the thing I want to uh, drive home about the Clapeyron equation. We're dealing with phase changes between solids and liquids. So you hopefully know that if you were to melt ice, so ice is a solid, if you melt it into its liquid form, so just you know liquid water, the volume overall isn't going to change that much. Okay, um, there's going to be a difference in volume between the two phases, but it's not going to be huge. In fact, both solids and liquids have defined volumes. The volume is really an intrinsic property of that liquid or solid. It doesn't require a container to have the volume. For example, I have my computer right here that I'm actually talking into right now. That computer has a volume. It's a solid, right? Okay, theoretically, if I were to melt that computer, I guess this is a bad example, it would still have a defined volume, but it'd be all over the table. Okay? Gases do not operate this way. Okay? Gases do not have a defined volume. In fact, the container that the gas is contained in defines the volume. So the, the volume is not an intrinsic property of the gas itself. To conceptualize this, imagine you have um, imagine you have a can of soda that's not opened yet. You know that there's carbon dioxide in the can. That's what gives the can its fizz, right? Your soda. Okay. Now, that gas is contained in the can, which has a defined volume. Now, open the can and let all the gas come out over the course of however many hours it takes for the soda to lose its carbonation. Now, the gas is contained in whichever room you're in. And that room obviously has a higher volume than the can. Okay? It's still the same amount of gas, but the volume changes depending on the container in which the, the gas is in. So we can't use the molar volume here because that's not an intrinsic property of the gas. Instead, we should use something like pressure. So therefore, if we use the ideal gas equation for this change in molar volume, or really just the molar volume, we can show the molar volume is equal to RT over P. And so if we substitute this delta molar volume or change in molar volume with just RT over P, we end up with this form of the uh, Clapeyron equation, which is dP dt is equal to uh, the molar enthalpy of vaporization divided by the temperature. Okay, And then if we substitute out that change in molar volume, since it's in the denominator here, we'll actually end up with pressure of the gas in the numerator divided by RT. Okay, um, Again, the reason this is now delta H of vaporization is because the clausius clapeyron equation instead is used to predict the slope of the tangent line of the boundary between liquid and vapor phases. So now we're not dealing with solids, we're dealing with uh, liquids and vapors. Um, and technically you could have sublimation, but in general we're going to think about this with liquids and vapors. Because the liquid has a defined volume, which is arguably very small, if you vaporize it, now the volume is essentially enormous. Okay, It's enormous. So we can neglect this change in molar volume because relative to the volume of the gas, the volume of the liquid is negligible. So that's why we can essentially think of getting rid of this delta. And now we have this form of the Clapeyron equation. What I'm going to do here is I'm now going to group the differentials. Okay, So I do have this uh, dp dt. This is a differential equation, but it's actually a separable differential equation because I can get all the pressure terms on the left side and I can get all the temperature terms on the right side. So what that means is, is if I first think of dividing this p over to the left side, um, and then I multiply this dt over to the right side, that would get all the pressures on the left and all the temperatures on the right. So if I do that, I get dp divided by p, okay, so all the p's are now over here, and then this equals delta H of vaporization, the molar quantity that is, divided by r, and then I have 1 over temperature squared times dt. The reason temperature is squared is I have two temperatures here on the right side, so if I group them I get t squared, and then dt is now on the right side. 
Um, this is perfect because delta H of vaporization technically is a function of temperature. Um, so if you had a function for this where it was dependent on temperature, um, this would have to be on the right side anyway. Okay, um, But it turns out that over very small changes in temperature, um, this is more or less a constant. But this, we can now integrate both sides. Okay, I've got the dP on the left, dT on the right. All my terms are separated. So if I integrate the left side, it would be from pressure 1 to pressure 2. And if I integrate the right side, it would be temperature 1 to temperature 2. And what you can show through integrating this is, if you integrate this correctly, you get the clausius clapeyron equation. And so the clausius clapeyron equation down here in its most useful form is the natural log of P2 over P1 is equal to the negative change in molar enthalpy of vaporization over R times the quantity 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Now, the one, this is right here, I can just assure you, this is the correct, one correct form of the equation. One thing you have to watch out for are the ones and the twos. Sometimes you'll see up here P1 divided by P2 in this natural log, and that'll cause this negative sign to go away. So you'll just see a positive delta H of vaporization over R. So you do have to watch the negative signs here. That's the only thing that's really confusing about this equation, but we can actually use this equation now to solve problems in physical chemistry, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that in the next video. We're gonna work an example using the clausius clapeyron equation. So join us then. But to conclude this video, hopefully you've understand where these two equations are derived from, how they arise. Um, they have to do with a phase diagram. You actually use this to actually conceptualize the derivation. And then the clapeyron equation, normally in this form, we're gonna use it to predict the slope of the tangent line between solid and liquid phases. And the clausius clapeyron equation generally is gonna be used for the same thing, but for liquid and vapor phases because gases do not have a defined volume. They're much, much larger in volume, so to speak, than uh, liquids or solids. So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. As I mentioned in the next video, we're gonna work an example using the clausius clapeyron equation. Join us then, thank you.